So thank you for being here. I also have a passage that I think we're going to cover. There's one of the most encouraging passages I think you can read in the Bible. And that's, well, there's many, but this is one of them. And I want to share it with you. I think we all need strength and hope, and we need encouragement. We also need comfort. And that's what we're going to find in this story right here from Isaiah. I know that we like the promises of God. And sometimes we can become impatient with those promises, the fulfillment of them. Like this one in Galatians 6, verse 9. Never become weary in doing good, for at the proper time you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. Well, we have to be patient. And there were people who were impatient who were taken as exiles to Babylon. If they had just gone to this passage that was available for them, they would have been encouraged. They would have received that strength, that encouragement that they needed, the hope that they needed, the comfort they needed, if they would have just read it. But we're going to read it this morning. And I want to start with this. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. It's interesting that Isaiah uses this passage, the characteristics of an eagle, to relate to those who trust in God. And when we understand the characteristics of eagles, it's easy to see why Isaiah is using this comparison for those who hope in the Lord. An eagle has a God-given design to sense the motion of the currents. And as a result, an eagle can be perched on a tree or rock and will wait until the right breeze comes along. And then they can soar with that. He waits. Some translations say, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. When the right breeze comes along, the eagle launches out, flopping its wings. But mostly the eagle glides and is borne aloft on the wings of the wind. Eagles use very little energy of their own. They fly so high, taking long glides to cover ground, soaring up again and repeating the process. I read about an incident of a man piloting a glider in the Rockies. And when he hit a thermal updraft, he rode that glider as high as he could get it. And it was like 14 or 15,000 feet. Very high for a glider. And when he looked out the window, he said this, you'll never guess I saw eagles. They had the ability to lock their wings. It looked like they were asleep. They were, they were just riding the wind so effortlessly. So eagles follow the wind using very little energy. And we get our power from the Lord. So we see why Isaiah compares eagles to those who trust, hope, and wait on the Lord. Our power will then come from the Lord. How much energy do we need? Well, we need to work hard, of course, for the Lord. But we get that, that hope, that energy from the Lord. And here's what Isaiah writes. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Why was this passage written? Because these people needed hope. They needed encouragement. They had no energy. They had no strength. They had lost everything. He's writing about people who were taken as exiles to Babylon. They had lost loved ones when Nebuchadnezzar came with his vast army against Jerusalem and destroyed the temple and destroyed the walls, everything. Their homes were devastated. They lost everything. The Babylonians destroyed it all. 
And they took it. They took these people. The picture of the Ishtar Gate to Babylon itself was discovered by archaeologists and is now in a museum, I believe, in Berlin. They may have gotten close enough to see this as a captive people. And we are getting a picture of how they could be weary and exhausted. The Babylonians confined them to an area outside of Babylon. Isaiah refers to people who are faint, weak, weary, tired, and exhausted. And he prophesied about this time when he said to Hezekiah over a hundred years before. He prophesied about it. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your fathers have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of the descendants and some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, who will be born to you will be taken away. And they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. But in Isaiah's letter, he also foretold the end of the kingdom, the Babylonian kingdom, that destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. And here's what he writes. Sit in silence. Go into darkness, daughter of the Babylonians. No more will you be called queen of kingdoms. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar built this city. It was vast. It was awesome. The grandeur of Babylon. But it was over. It's desolate. There's been a little bit of reconstruction done in Iraq. But at the beginning of, of chapter 40, Isaiah describes preparing the way back home and rebuilding Jerusalem. The people should have read these words of Isaiah over and over again. The words say that the captives in Babylonian exile will return home. God promised, but during the captivity they forgot his promise and were in despair. And so does God know? Does God care? Can he help those in intolerable situations? This is their attitude. Those left in Jerusalem have the same attitude. Then the answer comes back if they read what was written decades before to those who are wondering, does God care? Does God know? Who are discouraged? The answer is the same for us who may be discouraged. Go to the resource written thousands of years ago now. Go to God's Word. And just rereading the words from Isaiah should begin to reassure us. These teachings to the captives were to, begun, were to be taught in the following type of attitude. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. And so this is the approach that God wants them to use. Those who would be teaching this. They were to tell, the, and it's a tender approach. We see that God's power gives strength. And as you read through this passage, we're going to look at it. We see the power of God in His creation. And when we look at this, that should give us strength when we realize that we also have access to that power through the principles, through the teachings that he has that gives us hope. And we also see that God's presence is there with them as a shepherd leading them back to their home. And when we realize that Jesus is with us, that should give us encouragement of his presence through the Holy Spirit in our lives. We also see the promises that he gives should give us comfort and encouragement. The idea of waiting with hope is what the pictures with a soaring eagle are running and walking without becoming weary and weak. That's what they give. They give hope. 
And so first of all, let's notice the power that God gives, and we see it demonstrated and exemplified through his creative power. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, my cause is disregarded by my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. And if we just go back to verse 26 right before this, we'll see that coming through. Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name. Each by name? That's power right there. There's so many. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. And so the sun is about one of an estimated 100 billion stars all revolving in a spiral-shaped disk that we refer to as the Milky Way galaxy. This was taken from Hubble years ago, but each one of those is not a star. It's a galaxy. A galaxy. That shows you how vast, and each one is named by God. He has a name for them. And so we also find that this is the kind of power and strength to which Isaiah is referring. The source of this kind of power is God. Strength is needed. And, so, and it's available to the weak, the faint, the weary, the exhausted. Paul writes of this power when he, when he says this to the church at Ephesus, he says, Now to him who was able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Ephesians 3. When we read of such power which works in us through his wisdom or teaching, it should uplift us. But what were they doing? They were forgetting about his power. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart. Do not let wisdom and understanding out of your sight. They will be life for you, an ornament to grace your neck. Forgetting is what the captives were doing. And look at them, they were weak, they were disheartened. They needed encouragement. They needed comfort. Well, by wisdom, the Lord laid the earth's foundations. By understanding, he set the heavens in place. God created the universe with his power and wisdom. And now we have access to his power through his wisdom. But what were these discouraged people doing? They were only looking at the burdens that they were having the weight that was on their own shoulders. And they were only focused on that. They were not looking at what God provided. They weren't seeing the whole picture of those who can trust in God and the power that comes that way. Life, by trusting in God, we have understanding. We have understanding of God's love, His power, His wisdom. that It can be brought about in our lives by trusting in Him. No matter how dark things seem at any given time, there is always hope for those who trust in the Lord. So we've got to see the whole picture. He gives strength to the weary. Strength to the weary increases the power of the weak. And we see that through his wisdom we get this. A wise man has great power. And a man of knowledge increases strength. So the strength that comes is in God's knowledge, knowing that his instructions are for our good and for the good of others. And so we see the second point here, the principles that he gives on how to live this life or for hope. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. In a practical way for us to hope in the Lord that brings strength into our lives and endurance is to use God's wisdom. Eat honey, my son, for it is good. 
Honey from the comb is sweet to your taste. Know also that wisdom, wisdom is sweet to your soul. If you find it, there's a future hope for you. And your hope will not be cut off. One way that Paul tells us to practice this wisdom is to share and to give to others. And Paul writes this to Timothy. Command, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. If we do this, what will happen? Well, here's an exciting example that I just read in the news. A woman walks about two and a half miles to work every day. She lives in the cold of Michigan. And she walks there and she works in a deli in the uh, grocery store. She's coming back about five o'clock in the afternoon and she stops at a quick stop in order to warm up some. She looks down near the entrance door and she sees a Ziploc bag full of money. And so what is she to do with this is the question. Well, she's out. She's walking because she didn't have a car. She didn't have the money for a car. She needs the money. She needs this to be life-changing to her. But what does she do with the bag of money? Her integrity and honesty will not allow her to keep it. And the thought of keeping it never entered her mind. She immediately picks it up, goes inside, tells the clerk to call the police. The police come. And what the police found in the bag was $14,780 and wedding cards. Well, this was a gift. The police discovered to a couple who had been married that day and somehow they had dropped that that. Ziploc bag of all that money. And look what she did. She didn't keep it. She gave it to them. And so when one of the officer's wives heard of this, she decided to put up a GoFundMe page for her. For the good deed that she did. Well, now you probably know about this story if you've read the bulletin article because that's what I wrote about this last week. And it came to 2,400 people giving $66,000 at the time. Now I want to tell you how many. Now there are over 20, uh, 2,900 and have given over $82,000. And then a further end of this story is that she now has a new car from a dealership there nearby with some funds left over. But Diana, or Diane, was generous in what she did when she was in such desperate need herself. And she gave freely by not keeping the bag of money. She was generous, and because of her generosity, she is being abundantly blessed. And the proverb of God's wisdom says this. It, it comes true. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. People curse the one who hoards grain, but they pray God's blessing on the one who is willing to sell. Well, she was willing to sell. She didn't keep that bag of all that money. And now look at how God is blessing her with more than 2,900 people giving. And in their giving, they are not only refreshing her, but they're refreshing themselves, aren't they? And so we see the power of of God in that. The principles, they gave hope. Another thing that we see in, in Isaiah's message here is the presence gives encouragement. Well, Isaiah's message, this is God's message, was that God would bring them home to Jerusalem. And His presence should encourage them. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up. Every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level. The rugged places a plain. In other words, the King, God, is returning with His people. 
Just remembering these words should have helped strengthen those who were downcast about their situation. And this passage has a double meaning because it was used in the New Testament about John the Baptist preparing the way through repentance and through his teachings of making the, the not literal ground, but the, the lives of people receptive to the good news of Jesus Christ. So hope brings endurance and power, soaring, running, and walking. In other words, hope energizes a person. So Isaiah writes, You who bring good tidings to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, Here is your God. See, the Sovereign Lord comes with power, and His arm rules for Him. See, His reward is with Him, and, he, and His recompense accompanies Him. He tends His flock like a sheep. God is bringing them home to Jerusalem, keeping them close to Him like a shepherd would lead His sheep. This good news message was also for those who remained in Jerusalem in the collapsed defensive walls that were there. Isaiah continues by saying that he gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that help young. God's presence is like a shepherd leading his flocks, and that brings this people, that, is bring, that brings them encouragement. Jesus promised this to us. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Luke writes this, that when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Now, how is it that Jesus fulfills this promise that I'll be with you always to the end of the age? Well, I think it's this way. It's with the presence of the Holy Spirit. When Paul writes to the church at Philippi, he, he describes the Spirit in this way, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. So under challenging times, let the Spirit of Jesus Christ, who dwells in us, reassure us with courage and encouragement. And that's the answer to Jesus' promise of the Holy Spirit. What about the promises that, that give comfort? Well, he says, comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. And proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. He is proclaiming to them that God has forgiven them. God has lifted them out of the burden of sin. And a new life can now begin. And that's what forgiveness brings. Certain leaders or prophets among those exiled to Babylon and those remaining in Jerusalem were to give this comforting message and they were to do it tenderly. It's a promise of comfort. Can you think of a better promise than one that promises comfort? People need that kind of encouragement, especially people who are faint, weary, weak, tired, and exhausted the people we've been studying. And he then tells them to rely on what is permanent. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I try? All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass 
withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. The glory, the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all mankind together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. It's a promise of comfort. And he promises to return the exiles to their home of Jerusalem. And here is how he will do that. This is written well over a hundred years before it happened. I will raise up Cyrus in my righteousness. I will make all his ways straight. He will rebuild my city and set my exiles free. But not for a price or reward, says the Lord Almighty. So Babylon fell to the Persians under Cyrus the Great in 539 B.C. And this is the tomb of Cyrus, still standing in Iran today. Cyrus then reversed the practice of the Babylonians by deporting people away from their hometowns. He, he reversed that and started sending people back to their home countries. He sent them back to their home. Some Jews returned to Jerusalem in about 538 B.C., and the book of Ezra tells of the first two returns in 538. And then Ezra came years later in 458. But God promised to return and did. And so what do we see in this? We have promises for, from God that apply to us. Like the one Jesus made about being with us right now in this worship assembly. And when we leave... His presence should give us encouragement and comfort. And His power gives us strength. The power of His wisdom that He used to create the universe. We now have access to that power when we practice His wisdom. So let's practice by trusting God and obeying His instructions. And when we do, we have hope. And so Peter uses part of this passage when he writes this. Now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable things, such as silver or gold, but with, but with imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And this was the word preached to you. Well, that's it. I find a lot of comfort in that passage. I find that it brings strength and encouragement and hope. And if you need strength, encouragement, and hope, then that lesson has been for you as well. And we need to look to Jesus. And we need to soar on wings like eagles. We need to run and not grow weary, walk and not be faint. And that will happen when we trust in the Lord. Jesus says, come to me all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If you need Jesus this morning, if you have not come to him before and met him in the waters of baptism where he meets you as your master,